This just might kill you. I remember when I first heard about Dr. Gidley. I was eating gigantic ravioli at Giuseppe's with doctors Coons and Zabo. A part of the job interview process, I recall several interesting things about those early pre-hire days. One, Terry Thomas told me about a bridge on the way to Beaver, a truss bridge with three arcs of green steel. They're varied to look like the three bumps of a beaver when it's swimming. The first bump being the head, the long middle bump is the body, and the last bump is the tail. And he said that if I didn't see the beaver in the bridge, I might not be born again. <laughs> Two, the first day, I was sent by Dr. Zabo to have lunch with students at Pizza Joe's. The Corcoran brothers were there with their beautiful beards. And there was another student, and she knew more about American literature than I did, so I didn't bother to learn her name. <laughs> After lunch, the squad of brilliant youths deposited me back at Ferncliff, and I was standing at the bottom of the stairwell when I overheard Dr. Zabo. She was at the top of the stairs, just around the corner. The brilliant Americanist student was with her. In quiet tones, Dr. Zabo asked, any red flags? I didn't hear the student's answer. This was just before I walked up the hill to tread the bed of coals that is a faculty personnel committee meeting. <laughs> I sat down at a table in Northwood, a table so long that if you floated it beside the sinking Titanic, Rose probably still would have found a way to let Leo die. <laughs> I sat between Terry Thomas and Jim Gidley, thunderclouds of mirth and Harvard. I'd heard about Dr. Gidley. Coons and Zabo told me about this engineer who could do his work like a champ and do our work better than we could do it. Dr. Coons told me that this engineer has mastered the novel Frankenstein. Then Coons asked me, have you ever read it? I didn't lie, I just said, what a book. <laughs> That's not a lie. It's not anything, it's just words standing in the place of a lie. <laughs> Though I did try to read it once and I gave up. I just have trouble with novelists who write like they're Ebenezer Scrooge's paid by the letter. Writing fiends who break off engagements to perfectly attractive, albeit dowerless girls because there's no time for love when every loop-de-loop -loop of the quill says cha-ching in their depraved brains. And now I'm conscious that that was a very long sentence that no one is ever going to pay me for. Why am I doing this? <laughs> Dr. Coons told me that this Renaissance engineer man knows Dr. Frankenstein's monster so well that he can slip into the role and speak to modern audiences in the voice of the monster, electrifying the 19th century text so that it stands up, casts a shadow, where all I know about the monster is a long, bad friend good. <laughs> so there I was, sitting between Terry Thomas and the literary monster, Dr. Jim Gidley, ready to face what Don Opitz called a motley crew of cross-examiners, while Dr. Linda Zabo sat at the far end of the room watching me with the mysterious answer to her question glistening in her eyes. Any red flags? I still don't know the answer to that question, but I can imagine it. The questions flew. The committee asked me, do you believe in Jesus? Yes, I said. They wanted more. <laughs> yes, absolutely. They wanted more. Yes! They wanted more than yelling. I did my best to prove to born-again theological ninjas that my soul has been regenerated, knowing full well that all the words I used have been abused by fakers to sell snake oil to passers-by since the beginning of time. Do you believe in him or not? I do believe in God. I do, I do, I do, I do. Terry Thomas rescued me from this by asking if I'd seen the beaver in the bridge, and I said, yes, and we transitioned. <laughs> It came up in the meeting that I'm a creative writing instructor. I talked until I sounded like an idiot hippie son of Emerson, claiming that as long as we have stories, what do we need laws for? Or food? Or mathematics? And I started singing, come on people now, smile on you brother, everybody get together, let's love one another, right now! At that point, Dr. Gidley unlocked his Harvard jaw and said, what if I am a medical doctor? and I need to write a memo to nurses so that they do not administer an injection incorrectly that causes my patient to die. 
Will writing a story help me do that? <laughs> Golfer's laughter rippled around the table. The committee members looked to me for my answer. I didn't have to open my mouth. It was already open, and I said, well, come on, people now. <laughs> Smile on you, brother. Everybody get together. There's a lot of know who's got right now. I was lucky that day that the examiners utilized the old adage, not all that glitters is gold, and especially its lesser well-known brother, not all surface-level idiocy goes all the way to the bone. <laughs> but Jim's original question still haunts me. What if something I write kills someone someday? That is why, on risky documents that I write, I now attach the disclaimer, this just might kill you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Dr. Jim Gidley. Something that may be a little new for a Geneva reading series. I'm going to do a, a literary presentation with some illustrations. Using the United Technology of PowerPoint. But thank you for the opportunity to do this again. This is great fun, it's great humor. My turn tonight is to be serious. Nakahama Manjiro, <clears throat> Joshua Slocum. Familiar names to you? No? I'm about to press these men into literary service, <clears throat> but before I do so, I thought I should tell you a little about them. Nakahama Manjiro was a Japanese fisherman. He was born in 1827 and shipwrecked off the barren volcanic island of Torishima at the age of 14. He was picked up by an American whaling ship, and he returned with the captain, William Whitfield, to Fairhaven, Massachusetts, my hometown. For a time, Manjaro attended the Oxford School, where my mother taught for a time, over a century later. Manjaro was one of the first Japanese people to live in America. The town of Fairhaven maintains a memorial in his honor in the Millicent Library. McCartney Library has its charms, but it doesn't displace my affection for the more beautiful Millicent. Joshua Slocum was born in Nova Scotia in 1844 and early in life took to the sea. Down on his luck in the 1890s, he was offered a ship by an old acquaintance, Evan Pierce, in Fairhaven. It turned out to be a dilapidated old sloop, and Slocum spent over a year rebuilding the spray plank, plank by plank. In 1895, he embarked alone for a journey around the world, which he completed three years later, the first person ever to accomplish a solo circumnavigation. He memorialized his voyage in a delightful book, Sailing Alone Around the World. Uh, I think very likely uh, Dan is going to end the evening's proceedings by saying, among other things, read something. Read Sailing Alone Around the World. Fairhaven has che cheerfully adopted him as a native son, and the student newspaper of Fairhaven High School is named The Spray. I edited The Spray in my senior year. Recently, I wanted to write some poems, and I needed a form. I tend to agree with Robert Frost that writing free verse is like playing tennis with the net down. I settled on the tanka, 
an ancient Japanese form consisting of five lines, <clears throat> each with a set number of syllables, in the pattern 57577. A Japanese gentleman was expected to be able to compose a tanka spontaneously on suitable occasions. And thus, the early, earliest Japanese poetry is embedded in mythical and historical narratives, often sung by the protagonists. I needed plausible protagonists to hold my poems together, and I've called upon Nakahama Manjiro and Joshua Slocum. My series is entitled The Restless Earth. Darme la lucha. El Hiero Los Volcanes, Pablo Neuda. Yes, Michel, Pablo, Michel. Book one, Red Rock Fever. Nakahama Manjiro and Joshua Slocum set sail from Fairhaven in a new sloop, the morning mist. After sailing eastward for 2,000 miles, they dropped anchor at Ponta Delgada on São Miguel Island and went to see Lagoa das Sete Cidades. Their guide told them the legend of a shepherd boy and a princess who fell in love. When the king forbade the shepherd ever to see her again, they had one last tryst and wept so much that they filled the lakes, <clears throat> one blue and the other green. Then Manjiro-san composed this song. Shepherd and princess, hearts united and broken, four red eyes weeping, before now undivided, yielding blue and green waters. And Captain Slocum replied, Earth's crust and mantle, by force gigantic broken, spewing red lava, long since cooled and softened, cradling blue and green waters. And they sailed north over the broken spine of the ocean, where far below the restless earth buckled and heaved, slowly pushing continents apart and releasing the vital heat of the planet. As they passed Circe, Captain Slocum said, it appeared in 1863, the flow of ash and lava pushing up through the sea. But the sea has its revenge. Much of the island has washed away. And then Manjiro san sang. Didn't see that yet. There we go. Newly created, living fire, chilling water, swift birth, slow dying. The ocean so resentful of land, the brash intruder. As they sailed on, the captain said, Here the Gaelic slaves of Hjor Lyfur Anarson, a Viking lord, fled after they had slain their master. His brother Ingolfor hunted them down and killed them all. So these islands are called the Vestmana Ayar, the islands of the West Men. Then the captain composed this song. Blood for blood spilling, West Men and rocks uprising. Blood laving lava, losing the land and gaining the land's name for the nameless. As they entered the harbor of Haimae, the captain said, this handsome harbor was created by the lava and very nearly destroyed by it. In 1973, Altfeld erupted and the lava flowed over half the town and toward the harbor. The people began to pump seawater onto the lava to cool and solidify it. Against all odds, they succeeded. Then the captain sang, River of lava, threatening home and livelihood, unlikely loser, cooled and congealed by water, old and mortal enemy. Then they sailed south again for many days, and passing through the pillars of Hercules, they entered the Mediterranean, called by the Romans Mare Nostrum, our sea. They anchored at Naples and went ashore. They toured Pompeii and saw the ruins of the city that was choked to death in a few minutes in 79 AD, buried under the ash of Vesuvius. Then they climbed the mountain itself 
<clears throat> mingling with the many tourists to view the still living volcano. The captain sang, quick undertaker, shrouding Pompeii's 10,000, now tourist tempter, monthly hosting 10,000, biding your time quietly. Taking leave of sunny Naples, <clears throat> they passed an island that was smoking by day and glowing by night, as if to mimic the Lord's pillar of cloud and fire by which he had led Israel out of Egypt. Anjirasan asked, do you know this fiery island? Captain Slocum said, it is Stromboli, nicknamed the lighthouse of the Mediterranean. It never ceases erupting. Then Manji Rasan sang, Open wound island, the world's blood ever bleeding, its ash breath breathing, sailor's way ever lighting, beacon for Mare Nostrum. They sailed on to Messina and climbed the great mountain on the island of Sicily. They heard the ancient myth that Etna was the forge of Hephaestus, where he and the Cyclops forged thunderbolts for Zeus. The mountain has been very active, bursting out through new fissures and calderas, burying towns and villages, <coughs> ejecting great plumes of ash, and drawing skiers, cyclists, and tourists. Anjirasan composed this song. With tongs and hammers, Hephaestus on Earth's anvil, forging thunderbolts, every green slope blackening, every home and heart shaking. They sailed again eastward to the Aegean Sea and came to the island known to the ancients as Thera and to us as Santorini. Anjirosan cried out, the sea has entered the crater and the city is built on its rim. The captain replied, there was a great civilization here in ancient times. In 1610 BC, the island exploded, generating a tsunami that inundated much of the north coast of Crete. Then sang Manjirasan, tsunami maker, washing Crete into the sea. Now Crater Island with perched houses and churches, your white stone memorial. They sailed south through the Red Sea and around the Horn of Africa. They anchored in the port of Mombasa, where they wished to see the great mountain, Kilimanjaro, on the border of Kenya and Tanzania, almost touching the equator. The glacier on the mountaintop has been shrinking in recent years. The captain composed this song, Confident lava, striving upward to the clouds. Uneasy glacier settling down on the mountain, waiting for killing warmth. They continued south and sailed around the Cape of Good Hope and then westward into the heart of the South Atlantic Ocean. For many days they saw no land. And then on the western horizon, a mountain gradually rose out of the sea. And days later, they dropped anchor in the tiny harbor of Edinburgh of the Seven Seas, having seen the lava flow that caused the evacuation of the island in 1961. The captain sang, the vast Atlantic, your surrounding horizon, lonely sentinel, flare so inhospitable, chasing men across the sea. After resting for some time on Tristan de Puna, they recrossed the Atlantic and the equator, sailing 5,000 miles to the West Indies and the island of Martinique. Captain Slocum said, I remember this island well. In 1902, Mount Pele erupted. The pyroclastic surge rolled down the mountain at 400 miles per hour and flattened St. Pierre a beautiful city that we called the Paris of the West Indies. 30,000 people were killed. There were only three survivors. The one I remember best was August Cyparis. He had been thrown into the city jail for wounding a man with a cutlass, some say killing him the night before the eruption. He was badly burned, but four days later, rescuers heard his cries. His crime was pardoned 
for who was left to accuse him. And Manji Rosan composed this song. Jonah in the jail, swallowed by the sea of ash, buried in the fire, left for dead, resurrected on the fourth day, and pardoned. They spent many days on the pleasant island, and Captain, Captain Slocum said, we have completed the first part of our journey. We go on to Mexico and then to the Pacific. Book two, a Ring of Fire. They sailed west across the Caribbean to the port of Veracruz. Traveling by train to the central plateau of Mexico, they passed many magnificent peaks. But two stood out above the rest. The conductor told them the legend. Popocatepetl was an Aztec warrior, and Iztaccíhuatl was the emperor's daughter. Popocatepetl but sent him into battle, hoping he would not return. When news arrived of his death, Iztaccíhuatl perished from great grief. But Popocatepetl returned and claimed the body of his bride-to-be. He carried her away, and the gods turned them both into mountains. She lies sleeping but he still fumes with rage. Manji Rasan composed this song. Fuming warrior watching over his lost love, raging fire and ash, she deaf to his hot lament, ever sleeping quietly. They traveled further west to the state of Michoacan to see Paripitin, the volcano that had sprung up in 1943 in a farmer's field. By 1952, it had ceased erupting and is now thought to be extinct. The captain composed this song. Born in a cornfield, eating corn, silage, farm, village, almost swallowing the church, living and dying in less than a boy's lifetime. Returning to the morning mist, they sailed through the Panama Canal and turned northward along the coast, for Manji Rasan wished to see Mount Rainier, reported to resemble his beloved Mount Fuji in Japan. Manji Rasan said, Captain, did you know that there are thousands of volcanoes under the sea? There's one nearby called Axial Sima. It is about a mile deep. Captain Slocum composed this song. Under the ocean, fire flowing underwater, greater storms below than storms above, by sailors unsuspected and unseen. Having seen Rainier from afar, they changed course and sailed to Hawaii. They dropped anchor in Hilo and took an excursion to the summit of Mauna Kea, the site of 13 astronomical observatories funded by 11 countries. Captain Slocum composed this song. Atlas-like seamount, upraising island from ocean, your moonscape summit mimicking other worlds seen by your artificial eyes. They continued sailing west across the vast Pacific, bound for Manji Rosan's homeland, when they had anchored in Tokyo Bay, Manji Rosan said, my people say, a wise man climbs Fujisan once in a lifetime, but only a fool would climb it twice. Let's make our wise climb. So they did, and found at its summit an abandoned weather station, the Kusushi Shrine, and a post office. Manji Rosan composed this song sacred lotus peak, many feet treading on you, many hands painting your point portrait, and many voices singing your praise and beauty. Captain Slocum replied, shrine of a nation, entranced by your symmetry with a post office on the rim of your crater, and waiting for your dead letters. They took leave of Japan and sailed 4,000 miles to the southeast, arriving at the Sunda Strait between Java and Sumatra. 
they found the remains of Krakatau, which had exploded in 1883 with the loudest noise in modern history, heard on Rodriguez in the Indian Ocean, 3,000 miles away. Manjirasan sang, Sunda Strait Killer, slaying 36,000, 36, great roaring madman, thundering 3,000 miles, distributing your death throes. And they sailed 9,900 miles east to Tambora. Captain Slocum said, my grandparents told me of the 1815 eruption, the largest in recorded history. So much ash was thrown into the atmosphere that it darkened the sky around the globe and cooled the earth for a year. 1816 was known as the year without a summer. Crops failed and there was much suffering. He composed this song. Bringer of darkness, covering a hemisphere. Your heat bringing cold, <clears throat> making winter of summer. Famine felling more than fire. Having sailed to the east of New Zealand, they turned south, aiming for the pole. Through great swells, they crossed the Ross Sea and saw Mount Erebus rise over the horizon. A wisp of vapor at the summit hinting at the activity of the mountain almost continuously erupting. Captain Slocum composed this song. Fire of permafrost, awaking Antarctica, shaking and smoking, clothed with a smoke with a frozen mantle, unmoved by your shivering. Now the last leg of their journey took them over 4,000 miles to the northeast, to the lonely volcanic island Rapa Nui, christened Easter Island by Jacob Vragavin, the first European to see it, which he did on April 5th, 1722, Easter Sunday. The captain and Manjirasan climbed the highest hill of the island, Maunga Teravaka. Manjirasan said, this is a strange volcano. We walk on grassy slopes. Captain Slocum said, the volcanoes of this island are extinct and the lava is giving way to the green grass. He composed this song. Dead rock springing green, fire quenched by living water, life and hope rising, <clears throat> the reborn Paschal Island presaging the world to come. Their journey now ended, they prepared for their departure. Mandura pronounced this blessing. My honored captain, live for a thousand autumns and 10,000 years. And captain Slocum replied, the Lord be gracious to you this day and the world without end. They sailed away and the morning mist disappeared on the horizon.